right, well, welcome everybody and thank you very much for being here. It's about 12 noon and we're going to get started. I'm Brian Alexander at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. Before we move to our program, a couple of technical points for our Zoom meeting. Please, I ask all of you to keep your microphones muted unless you've been called on to speak. You will have the ability to turn on and turn off your own video, so it's your choice if you want to be visible or not. I chose this kind of format for a Zoom meeting, a meeting, not a webinar, so that we could all see and hear each other if we choose, but that does require a little attention to our own microphone and camera settings. The event is on the record and being recorded, so bear that in mind as you decide how to participate. So let's begin. Again, I'm Brian Alexander, Assistant Professor of Politics at Washington and Lee University. And my last job in DC was as an American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow in the office of US Senator Jack Reed. So greetings everyone from Lexington, Virginia. Today, we're joined by an esteemed panel of congressional scholars and experts to discuss congressional norms in an era of conflict. The United States Congress depends on informal rules, norms to function. Political scientists have long looked to the role of norms, speaking to the folk ways of Congress, norms such as courtesy and reciprocity that not only help the institution work, but that also signal a general attitude among lawmakers that cooperation is part of their identities as members of Congress. But in this age of partisan conflict, Many traditional norms, such as courtesy and reciprocity, seem like they're under siege. This raises important questions about what are the norms of the modern Congress? What role do they play in the functioning of the institution? How are these norms changing? And finally, what does all of this mean for how Congress serves American democracy? Fortunately, to help us address some of these questions, we're joined by five panelists who through their experience and scholarship on Congress can help us understand congressional norms of today. Let me introduce each before turning to them individually for their remarks. First is Julia Azari, Associate Professor of Political Science at Marquette University. Professor Azari is a frequent contributor to leading academic journals, blogs, and podcasts on American politics, as well as author of Delivering the People's Message, The Changing Politics of the Presidential Mandate. Next is Matt Green, professor of politics at Catholic University and author of numerous books, including the forthcoming Newt Gingrich, A Study of Party Entrepreneurship, co-authored with Jeffrey Crouch. Professor Green has a faculty commitment, so he's joining us a few minutes into the program. We're also joined by Jennifer Lawless, Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia, whose numerous works include the book, Women on the Run, Gender, Media, and Political Campaigns in a Polarized Era, co-authored with Danny Hayes. We are pleased to have with us Don Wolfensberger, Director of the Congress Project at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Don's contributions to our understanding of Congress are too many to mention but they include his most recent book, Changing Cultures in Congress, From Fair Play to Power Plays. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Rob Woodall, former representative of Georgia's seventh congressional district. During his 10 years in Congress, Mr. Woodall served as a Republican member on the House Committee on Rules, the House Budget Committee, and the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. We're very honored to have Mr. Woodall with us today to share his insights on congressional norms from the perspective of a long serving member. Thank you again to our panelists. My role today is to moderate the discussion. I do have a forthcoming book titled A Social Theory of Congress, Legislative Norms in the 21st Century, which is posted in the chat. But to me, this topic is so important that not only did I write a book about it, I want to build a conversation and to learn from others so that we can all begin to pay more attention to the interesting and important roles that norms play in Congress. 
Each panelist will speak for about eight minutes. Audience members, please join our conversation. We want to hear your questions and thoughts. When we turn to the question and answer section, please raise your hands either literally or using the raise hand function in Zoom or enter a request to ask questions in the chat dialog. If you wish to type rather than speak your question, do that in chat as well. Remember to please keep your microphones muted unless you're called on. My research assistant, Maria Kisker, a graduating senior in economics here at WNL, is here to help us take questions and to manage the Zoom. So without further ado, let's turn to our panel in the order uh, they were introduced. And we'll go first to Julia Azari, who's going to kick off our discussion. Professor Azari? Hi, thank you so much for that great introduction and for including me in this fantastic conversation. So it's, it's generous of you to include me in this esteemed group of congressional scholars. I would kind of classify myself more as a presidency and party scholar. And I want to talk about the impact of the Trump years on the norms that kind of govern across institutions, the president party relationship and the implications of that for, for the US Congress. I want to start by introducing a framework for thinking about norms that I think is, is useful and valuable, which is to separate them out into two broad categories. The first is democratic values. And I've written about this for 538, if anyone wants to read a bit more, but broadly speaking, the democratic values are the core principles that democracies need to thrive. Some of the ones that I and others have written about include legitimate opposition, the separation of private interests from public resources, institutional independence, the independence of, of the president of Congress, of the media, for example, um, of the states from the federal government, and finally, political equality. Those are, that's a non-exhaustive list, but I think those are some that, that help us uh, frame the impact of the, the Trump years. The second category is unwritten rules and informal scripts. And one of the things that I wanna really emphasize about this is that I think these can be value neutral when we talk about unwritten rules and informal scripts. So some, some people have written about these in a more, um, in a positive light, this, this would include some of the writing by, uh, by Steve Levitsky and Daniel Z. Blatt, who really popularized um, phrases like constitutional hardball and institutional restraint, um, norms like that. Brian has written about the kind of common purpose that norms can engender in, in Congress. Um, others, including myself, have been more critical of the role that norms and informal scripts and unwritten rules can play um, and the ways in which these can uphold power structures and actually block some block democratic progress. And Corey Robin has also written about this in this in this vein. So I think it's it's useful to kind of break these out as we think about the impact of the Trump years and the impact of Trump and Trumpism on the parties and on Congress. I want to start by thinking about the thing I spend most of my time thinking about, which is the relationship between the president and his political party. In some ways, Trump's Trump's efforts to become the kind of undisputed leader of the Republican Party is are really the, the stuff that past presidents have fantasized about and never been able to accomplish. Trump has marginalized dissenters within his own party in a way that I think really would have, would have made um, folks like FDR jealous and that his use of his willingness to transgress um, both the unwritten rules and potentially some democratic values using Twitter, using his kind of mastery of, of conservative media, are really essential to this, to this process um, and to really taking over and making it a Trumpist party. On the other hand, one thing, if you look at these interventions, is they were often quite shallow. So his Twitter feed might have made him have in, inappropriately involved in intra-party politics in the past. Members of Congress and other um, and subnational party members have been a little protective of their territory and of the president being involved. Um, Trump doesn't uh, didn't believe in those boundaries, but. At the same time, he didn't really do things like establish well um, or challenge well-established incumbents in primaries and things like that. You know, when it, when push came to shove, he was often not in the driver's seat, and more well-established and networked Republican members of, of Congress often were. 
The second point that I want to raise has to do with the usefulness of norms for this kind of Trumpist outsider politics that's that's developed. And one of the things I want to emphasize here is that much of much of what we see that's that's kind of risen to the fore in the Trump era is not new and has roots not only in the kind of in the Obama years and the lead up. Um, I'm having balancing the iPad and the and the computer problem. Sorry, I keep bouncing around. Um, it's not only not only draws on themes that come from this immediately preceding period, but also, you know, many decades. And this idea of the outsider in American politics falls under this category. At the same time, I think one thing that, that's really evident in, in the development of Trumpism as a kind of political mold is the necessity and the symbiotic relationship with, um, with norms. I think one of the more significant pieces of Trump's legacy for Congress is the emergence of, of this kind of Trumpist politics and Trumpist members. Some of these folks are new members of Congress, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Lauren Boberts of, um, of the world. We also have kind of Tea Party era people like Matt Gates, Ron Johnson. Um, I would also include uh, Kevin Kramer in this, um, in this list, although he's maybe not as loud as some of the other folks on the list, but um, Trumpist members of, of Congress, we also have governors like Christy Noem and Ron DeSantis. And the, this politics is not really about having distinct issue stances that are discrete, that are, you know, easily, um, easily distinguished from other Republicans. It's really about this relationship with norms. And so it, it thrives on a politics of transgression and it needs something to transgress against. And that's, that's really important as we think about which aspects of, of la the lasting impact of Trump and Trumpism are, are deep or fundamental shifts in, in politics or in or relationship across institutions or within them and which elements are performative. These performative elements aren't always, it's not to say they're not important. I think they are very important, but they sometimes don't represent very deep shifts in actual institutional power. And I think that's some of, um, some of what's going on here. Some people have referred to this style of politics as vice signaling. Um, I think that's a, a kind of distinct feature of Trumpist politics that remains in the, in the Trump faction of the Republican party and the Trump faction in, um, in, in Congress. And so it's, it, it's really useful to look at the other side of that, of how it's dependent on, um, on norms to transgress. And there's a similar, similar kind of symbiosis for the performance of norms for those you know, relatively few Republican members of Congress who have more publicly distanced themselves from Trump. So I'm thinking of kind of Ben Sass, of Lisa Murkowski, of Susan Collins, um, to some degree, talking about norm transgression as the thing that they're opposed to actually gives them an opportunity to sidestep some of the ideological and policy claims. So this is one of the areas where I think it's, it's useful to really distinguish between what's a, what's a performance, um, what aspects of this are about rhetoric, and what kind of function that's playing politically, even as it doesn't fundamentally alter some of these relationships. I also think that this isn't exclusively confined to the Republican side of the aisle. And I've given some thought to both to the development of kind of outsider and anti-establishment politics and the kind of maverick politics and the way that that might be playing out right now with members like Kristen Sinema and uh, Joe Manchin, who've been getting a lot of attention in the Senate, specifically for their kind of unwillingness to go along with certain democratic priorities from, from minimum wage to the um, to filibuster reform. And people have kind of asked, you know, what is, what is their goal? What are they trying to accomplish? And there are a lot of different answers to that, but I think some of it is establishing a political project that is about being an outsider and pulling away from whatever it is your party expects. I mean, the norms, the performance of norms kind of feeds into this larger picture of, um, of outsider politics and the debate about between outsiders and establishment actors kind of replacing or papering over more substantive ideological and policy debates.
the the second thing I want to talk about really veers away from Congress, but I think it's really relevant to Congress, which is the question that I and a lot of other parties scholars have been contemplating, which is whether Trump rewrote the, the informal script for presidential nominations. And the 2020 nomination doesn't give us a lot of, doesn't really give us a lot of material to answer that question in a definitive way because it ended so strangely um, in the pandemic. But I think there's, you know, there's a possibility that Trump's successful entry into the 2016 race rewrote the kind of normal script about how unconventional candidates enter the process, how long candidates stay in. Um, and I suspect that this will actually have a couple of implications for Congress if, if I'm right that this, this is a longstanding feature. One is that we, we might expect that we're going to see something right as we've seen recently, which is that we alternate wildly between very experienced presidents who have a lot of name recognition because they've served in high levels of government, um, like Joe Biden. Um, those presidents are, or those candidates are advantaged by a more free form system, uh, but also candidates with high name recognition or are able to draw a lot of media attention who have no experience. So we might see more candidates, successful candidates like Trump, and maybe a more successful version of someone like Andrew Yang, who outpolled many conventional conventionally qualified politicians. Um, I think that will have implications for how Congress relates to the president. Um, the second thing is, I think it also made it more necessary for running for president became kind of the thing you have to do to get a national platform. And we really saw that in 2020 with so many members of Congress throwing their, their hats into the ring, even though it was a really long shot. That's not new. I think it's just probably amplified in this more free form period of nominations. And one implication that that has is that it will make, it will further contribute to what I think is a pretty unfortunate emergent norm, which is that very little gets done in an election year. That seems to be an expectation. I've, I've had conversations with, with students, um, with people who've worked on the Hill, where they sort of treat that as a given. Like, of course, nothing gets done in a presidential election year. Or you can't touch any big issues in a presidential election year. And it, that hasn't always been the case. And I don't think that democracy is well served by that. But that, that will probably become more the case if you have a substantial number of members of Congress running in a, in a big and complicated and lengthy primary. To wrap up, I wanna talk about the prospects for, for democratic values. And I think this is really on people's minds as we're contemplating where American democracy is, is at in this, this post-Trump Post Trump presidency period, at least this period of, of division, as the title of this panel suggests. Um, and I want to point out again that many of these signature challenges that I would identify as, as ways of, of things that undermine um, democratic values in American politics right now actually emerged during the Obama era of divided government. And so we have lack of respect for a legitimate opposition, which has also been amplified and the increased role of the executive in core policy areas because of the lack of cooperation between the president and Congress and sometimes within Congress. Um, those challenges continue today. They were both amplified in the Trump era, but have roots before it. Um, the second is, I think, you know, institutional independence and legitimate opposition were, were damaged um, by the Trump presidency and that the, particularly the way in which Trump was able to use Twitter and use the conservative media apparatus to kind of stamp out that institutional prerogative that members of Congress have held dear in the past. Um, that, that we saw less of that in, in the context of the impeachments, in the context of any number of challenging situations, I think um, is, is an impact. Um, it, the jury's still out on whether it's a, a lasting impact. Um, but I, I want to sort of also point out, as we are thinking about norms, the way in which Congress was was pretty bold in its violation of um, of norms in an important and democracy asserting way right. in early 2021. And perhaps one of the most norm violating things that we have seen in the Trump years was, um, in the strictest sense of the world, word was to see a second impeachment 
and an impeachment of a president who had already left office. And I think that really illustrates the way in which sometimes you have to break with with past tradition or with unwritten rules and informal scripts in order to assert more important underlying uh, more important underlying values. And there, I think, again, that process, that post-presidency impeachment also illustrated the importance of the performance of norms um, that can highlight in some ways the limitations um, of, um, of the process, the limitations, the lack of procedural teeth that Congress might have to hold presidents accountable, and yet, you know, at the same time can um, can capture the attention of the media and can be an important factor in reasserting some of these core values. So those are some of the lasting implications I see from, from Trump, the Trump period, Trumpism, and the implications for the kind of broader cross-institutional relationships. Terrific. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Julia. Um, let's uh, move to Matt Green. Matt, I see you've joined us. Uh, uh, I, I lost track of when you were coming in, but I um, uh, would love to uh, turn the uh, microphone over, over to you. And welcome. All right. Thanks, Brian. Uh, it's an honor to be invited to be a part of this panel with so many uh, distinguished uh, scholars uh, who have written uh, some great uh, work on norms and have studied it in, in uh, great detail. And I'm also looking forward, Brian, to your forthcoming book uh, on this subject. Um, before I talk about a few norms in particular in Congress and especially in the House of Representatives, I just wanna preface by saying, I think this is a really important subject. It's one that I don't think gets as much attention as, sh as it should, certainly in the study of Congress. Um, you know, a lot of uh, our field, a lot of our work focuses on uh, issues like um, incentives and the electoral connection, the drive to do things because you're going to get elected. Um, but norms are um, not always driven by electoral incentives, but are just as important in the way any legislature works, including Congress. Um, and it's often an implicit element in the work that we do. In fact, I was just um, for uh, my graduate course on Congress, I was just uh, rereading uh, David Mayhew's Congress, The Electoral Connection. And right in there, he actually talks about a norm in a footnote, talks about the norm of not attacking other members of Congress in the press, which seems to have gone by the wayside, uh, but I'll get back to that in a little bit. But the point is that even work that um, is seen by many as very incentive driven, uh, rational choice oriented um, can have a recognize the importance of norms. So what I wanted to do uh, in the time that I have is talk about three norms in particular that um, have gotten in the new, been in the news in recent years. Um, and in particular, talk about the ways in which they have or haven't eroded, and then glean a little bit from that what might explain what causes a norm in Congress to maintain itself versus to um, be eroded or even disappear. Um, and the, these norms are norms that um, sort of um, going off of uh, Julia's remarks and her point about some of these swing members in the Senate are norms not that partisanship would um, weaken, but actually norms that further enforce partisanship. When we think about uh, the importance of parties and, and the electoral incentives that lawmakers have to stay loyal to their parties, but there are also norms in Congress that further enforce partisanship and certainly uh, the loyalty to one's party. So I wanna talk about three of those in my perceptions about the extent to which they still exist in Congress. And I definitely look forward to um, the observations of the, the audience and Congressman Woodall about whether I'm, I'm right about these norms and whether they're still relevant today. So the first norm uh, that I want to discuss briefly is the norm of uh, <clears throat> not supporting primary challenges against fellow partisans. In other words, uh, you don't try to get your fellow party members out of office by challenging someone running against them in a primary. Um, this is obviously an important norm because it ensures there's inter-party harmony. It can be, you can take it very personally if one of your colleagues is challenging you or supporting someone who's challenging you in a primary. And of course, as a practical matter, if someone goes through a difficult primary, they may be weakened electorally and could lose their seat in a general election. Um, and this is a norm. There's no rule against it. Lawmakers can do as they please, but it is, I think, an important norm. If we look at the House of Representatives, uh, my impression is that this norm is by and large fairly closely followed by members of both parties. 
Um, I, the House Freedom Caucus, um, which you know has a reputation for being rebellious and challenging leaders, um, I don't think uh, they challenge incumbent members. They certainly play a role in primaries, but usually either in open seats or when a seat is occupied by a Democrat. Um, now, there have been some folks in the Democratic Party, uh, particularly Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, when she was first elected, she, I think she did a video where she said, it's time to go out and challenge other Democrats. It's like, I beat a Democrat in a primary, you should too. Um, but in the last election cycle, her political action committee, Courage to Change, um, I think they only, ch they only funded three primary challenges against incumbents. Of course, three is bigger than zero. Um, but um, you know, one of them, Dan Lipinski, was already seen as uh, fairly conservative in the party, particularly on the issues of uh, abortion and uh, choice, um, uh, Henry Cuellar and Richard Neal uh, were the other two. Um, and only Lipinski lost his primary. I think she also, the PAC also gave money to someone running in Neil Lowy's district, but uh, Congresswoman Lowy had retired at some point. So um, the point is that it seems like this norm is still fairly well followed in Congress today and helps enforce or encourage this idea of being part of a team when you're in Congress. You work with, not against your fellow partisans. The second norm that I think is important that's gotten attention in, in recent years is uh, to keep your intra-party disputes private. If you're in a disagreement with leadership or with other members of your party, that should happen behind closed doors. Now I think, uh, and this is important because uh, members of uh, both parties worry that it damages the party brand. It can make them look uh, weak, divided. The press loves conflict, so they report on that as opposed to things your party is doing. Now, I think this norm has been eroded to a somewhat greater extent and helped in part um, by some factors which I can talk about in a minute. Um, so you see Republicans, you know, conservatives in the Republican conference calling moderates rhinos, um, members of Congress uh, criticizing each other on impeachment. Um, on the Democratic side, you have some uh, usually quiet but sometimes open complaints on the left about moderate members. Uh, in the Senate, as mentioned, folks um, like Kirsten Cinema, Kirsten Cinema, uh, you know, uh, you know, folks on the left saying, you know, you've got to work with us. Why are you being so difficult, etc. Um, but I think, uh, although you hear that grumbling, you see it uh, maybe more than what party leaders would like. Um, I think it's still fairly well followed uh, in in Congress at, uh, to 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 some degree, uh, to a considerable degree. Now, the third norm I want to mention briefly is the norm of voting with your party on key procedural votes. And so not just voting in general, but key votes, votes that really matter to the party. And this is important because it helps ensure the party's uh, organizational and procedural power. So the selection of party leaders, for example, shaping chamber rules, setting the procedures for, setting, uh, for debating legislation. Um, the idea is that you can maybe vote against your party on certain bills and amendments, but when it comes to a key procedural vote, you don't. And this is a norm I think that has eroded the most in recent years, at least in the House of Representatives. So take for example, the motion to recommit, which was the uh, long standing um, opportunity or right of a minority, the minority party in the House to offer an amendment to a bill, uh, the sort of last bite at the apple, if you will. And the norm in the governing party is always you don't vote for these. You don't vote for motions to recommit. It's what the minority is doing. It's gotcha votes. You don't give them the power of, sh of shaping legislation or changing the agenda by voting for them. Um, but then what happens starting in 2007, I believe, and certainly uh, after 2000, uh, yeah, it's 2007, and then again um, in the last Democratic majority, um, is that there were defections on these motions to recommit um, in the Democratic ranks. And some of the times they actually passed. Um, sometimes by overwhelming numbers, by the way, but other times by fairly close votes because moderates in the Democratic Party would vote for these motions to recommit. Um, to the point that eventually House Democrats changed the rules of the chamber so that motions to recommit were not a free opportunity for the minority to offer whatever they wanted without any warning. To, in other words, make it harder for their, keep their own ranks from defecting and voting for these motions to recommit. Another procedural vote where we've seen a lot more defections than we used to are votes for speaker. So each party nominates a candidate for speaker and in the opening day of the house, those, uh, those nominees are voted on. And for many, many, many years, the norm is you never defect on a speaker vote. You just don't do it. 
If you do that, you might accidentally or intentionally give the minority party the opportunity to name a speaker. Um, and so defections were supposed to be at zero. The defections on these started to emerge under Newt Gingrich, and then in the last several Congresses, they've become endemic. In both parties, you see regularly uh, a not insignificant number, a, a handful or so of members of both parties voting against their party's nominee or voting, um, uh, not necessarily voting for the other party's candidate, but voting for other candidates, uh, abstaining or otherwise refusing to vote for their party's nominee. And that has, uh, on a couple of occasions at least, risked the, uh, the party's ability to choose their nominee for speaker. John Boehner had difficulty, Newt Gingrich before him. Um, so this has been significant, this, uh, the erosion of this particular norm. So if I'm right about these three norms and the extent to which they have or haven't eroded in recent years, what do they maybe tell us about the underlying conditions that uh, are necessary for a norm to continue versus a norm to be eroded or even abandoned? Uh, and I can think of three based on these cases. And admittedly, this is a very superficial analysis. I haven't dug into great detail, but in thinking about what's going on here behind the scenes, a few things came to mind that might tell us more about the factors that keep a, keep a norm going in Congress. I think the first is the role of leaders. Party leaders are very important. Um, party leaders in Congress take very, very seriously primary threats against their own members, and they also worry a great deal about internal disputes. And um, to a greater or lesser degree, leaders in both parties have worked very hard to keep their party unified, not challenge their colleagues in primaries, not to bring disputes open to the public. Um, but when it comes to some of these procedural votes, particularly the motion to recommit, um, depends on, uh, you know, from secondhand sources at least, it appears that one or more leaders in the Democratic Party um, basically said, it's okay if, you, if certain people defect on these motions to recommit. If you don't have leaders that insist on unity on a procedural vote, you're going to have defections. And so one important role might be the role of leaders, party leaders, in keeping norms um, in, in Congress. I think the second factor here is not just whether leaders play a role, but how many members of Congress are playing the enforcer. Um, and the more members of Congress who agree that a norm that is, is important and will enforce in various ways those norms, the more likely those norms are to remain. Um, there does not seem to have been the kind of broad-based um, belief in the Democratic caucus that motions to recommit should not, there should be no defections on those. Um, and so we've seen defections on those. Um, but on those other norms, those first two norms, there may be a broader group of members in both parties that believe those norms are value, are value, they value those norms and believe they should be enforced. So for this, I take a quote from an interview with Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez in the New York Times back in 2019, um, where she said, in many ways, I feel like I walk around with a scarlet letter because Many members who just have a primary, whether they know about it or not, tend to project that onto me. In other words, it's not just party leaders telling Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, don't try to primary your colleagues. It's just other Democrats. She's walking down the hall, she's on the House floor, and people are giving her a dirty look. Um, those kinds of informal sanctions can have an effect and send a message you should not be doing this. So uh, how many enforcers there are of a norm in Congress will matter. And then I think the third thing is how traceable uh, a particular norm is to voters or a particular action is to voters. I'm drawing here from uh, Doug Arnold's book, Logic of Congressional Action, where he talks about traceability. Um, when we look at votes for speaker, this is clearly a traceable vote. It's a public vote, it's a recorded vote, it's on C-SPAN, everyone's paying attention. There's a strong incentive to defect because you might be rewarded by voters for doing so in your district. Or, or, or conversely punished for failure to defect on a particular vote. Um, so there's a greater, not only is there incentive for electoral, per, uh, electoral position taking, but um, it's easier to do that. If you're backing someone in a primary, um, that's a little bit less transparent to voters. They may not be aware of it. A lot of them may not even really care if you're doing it. Uh, and so you don't have, it's not just the incentives, it's also just not as traceable between you and, and voters. Um, and similarly with motions uh, to recommit, those are very visible um, and you feel like that vote could be used against you in an election. Um, you know, maybe less so an issue about you know, speaking up about something you don't like in your particular, in your party or your party leaders. Um, 
So uh, I guess the, the takeaway here is I think that we can learn about the underlying factors that make norms more or less um, durable in, in a legislature. And also just a reminder that norms matter not just for um, ensuring bipartisanship and collegiality uh, among all members, but also matter in uh, reinforcing partisanship uh, and partis partisan behavior in Congress. Excellent, thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, very, very uh, provocative. Um, let's turn next to, uh, to Jennifer. Jennifer Lawless, University of Virginia. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna focus, I see the sun coming in, but it's so rare that there's sun um, that I'm gonna let it go. Uh, so I'm going to focus in particular on gender and the extent to which women and men operate differently within the institution of Congress and how norms might work a little bit differently. And to make a long story short, I basically find no difference. So we know that Congress doesn't function well um, from the perspective of voters. We know that public opinion polls systematically find that people believe that Congress would actually function better if we replaced every single member with a random person walking down the street. We know that in head-to-head -head races, lice outpoll member of members of Congress. And we also know that the overwhelming majority of voters believe that Congress is not taking seriously their representational responsibilities. A lot of people believe as well, and certainly female candidates argue, that if we had many more women in Congress, if they exceeded the 25% that they are right now, the institution would function differently. And the logic there is that with more women in Congress, you would wind up with more collaboration, more collegiality, and as a result, better outcomes. And norms of collegiality and cooperation have long been um, those that have been important to the chattering class in Washington, this idea that it's important who you grab a beer with, it's important who you meet on the golf course. All of these factors allow you to generate goodwill, develop relationships, and those relationships then become, um, in a lot of ways, the, the glue that holds together the institution and allows real work to get done. And Kirsten Gillibrand put it best. She said, imagine what Congress would look like. Imagine what we could do if we were 100% women. Imagine what cities would look like if every mayor was a woman. Imagine what state legislatures would look like if every member was a woman. And the press has picked that up. You can Google women in Congress and the kinds of stories that you'll get right away are women are the only ones in Washington who are doing the work. Women are the ones who get everything done. Women compromise, women go out to eat together. And as a result, you know, they pass bipartisan legislation. And this account has always struck me as a little bit ridiculous. And I say that because we know that party loyalty is actually currency in Congress. We also know that there's no reason to suggest that women are any less likely than men to want to get reelected. And as a result, they're accountable to their constituents. If female members of Congress are more likely to go against their constituents in the name of trying to pass legislation more broadly, there's no reason to expect that they won't be punished by voters. And so what Sean Theriault and I have done over the course of the last several years is conduct a series of systematic tests to assess the extent to which women seem to value collegiality more than men. Is that even true? Do they wanna develop these relationships more than men do? And second, if that is the case, does that actually translate into any meaningful legislative behavior? And so I just wanna quickly walk through um, some of the data and then talk about some of the implications. So the first thing that we needed to do was measure whether in fact women do place a greater premium on developing these kinds of relationships. Because if the conventional wisdom is right, if all of the, um, you know, if the journalists, if the members of Congress themselves uh, are correct in saying that women value these relationships more than men, then we need to be able to identify that that's actually the case. Now, collecting data on those kinds of relationships is tricky. I wish I had access to the congressional gym. I'd like to know who's working out next to whom. I'd like to know who lives close to whom. Um, you know, basically, I just want to be friends with every member of Congress. But given data constraints, what we were able to do was identify three activities that are actually open to every member of Congress. Um, and assess whether women and men are more likely to participate in them. So the first is the congressional baseball game and the congressional softball game. So every member of Congress, not in a pandemic, um, is allowed to participate in this activity. And it's sort of like a school spirit kind of activity. Um, you know, you practice, you get to meet other members of Congress, you get to work out with them, you get to engage in this game. Um, the Democrats um, play against the Republicans at the congressional baseball game. Uh, for the women's softball game, it's all members of Congress in a bipartisan way against the media, but members of both sides of the aisle attend and there's just generally goodwill um, generated at these activities. 
And we found out, in fact, that women were a little bit more likely than men to participate in these kinds of activities. Second thing we looked at was Al Franken's Secret Santa Gift Exchange. Um, when he was first elected in the Senate, he put forward a Secret Santa Gift Exchange where members of the Senate would sign up um, to participate. And based on contacts in his office, it became clear um, in our research that they took this very, very seriously. So seriously that they also almost treated it like getting co-sponsors for a bill, where they would send people around to all of the senator's offices to encourage their participation. And then they would assign them the gift. And so we have participation rates and Roll Call has run photos of all of the people who have participated over time. And it turns out here too, women are substantially more likely than men um, to engage in the Secret Santa gift exchange. So that's another example of you know, what looks to be women valuing these relationships. You not only participate by buying the gift, but you then go to this big luncheon and it just generates what's supposed to be friendships and goodwill. And then the third thing we looked at was Seersucker Thursday, which is a day in May where all members of Congress are supposed to wear Seersucker to harken back to the days of yore when there was no air conditioning in the Senate and Seersucker was a cool fabric. Trent Lott introduced this. Um, and we have the records of everybody who has participated in Seersucker Thursday going back to the 1990s when he created it. Um, and this was a, the, gathering those data was somewhat um, amusing. There are no official records. So I had a graduate student at the time who called Trent Lott and he kept the records himself and was more than happy for almost two hours to talk to her about every single Seersucker Thursday. Um, and there too, women were more likely than men to participate. So that first ingredient seems to be satisfied if you take with a grain of salt these measures of, co of collegiality. Women do seem to value, um, a little bit more than men at least, the idea of developing social interactions with their colleagues. And the key here is that those social interactions are bipartisan um, and that they are potentially able to create the glue that would allow for more productive legislating. And so what we did was now knowing whether and the extent to which every member of Congress, male and female, participated in these social engagement activities, we wanted to track whether that social engagement led to different legislative outcomes. And long story short, it did not. The first thing we looked at were congressional delegation trips. So these are trips that members of Congress take as fact-finding missions. They can be partisan or bipartisan. And we found that Democratic and Demo Democratic women and men behaved exactly the same way. Women were no more likely than men to take a bipartisan trip. They were no more likely than men to spend lengths, a longer amount of time on bipartisan trips. And the same thing was true when you compared Republican women to Republican men. So we found no difference there. And whether you had a high social engagement score did nothing to predict your likelihood of engaging in these bipartisan trips. Second thing we looked at was bill co-sponsorship. So the Luger Center at Georgetown tracks every, um, every bill and who the co-sponsors were. And so we know for every member of Congress, how many times they co-sponsored a bill of an out party member, as well as how many bipartisan co-sponsors they received on any bills that they introduced themselves. And here too, the logic should be that because women are more likely to build these relationships, they're gonna be more likely to attract out party co-sponsors for their bills because they're able to capitalize on these relationships. And we found that was not the case. Women and men were equally likely among Democrats and equally likely among Republicans to co-sponsor um, or not uh, the bills of members of the opposite party. And again, whether you were socially engaged played no role in your behavior. The third thing we looked at were the procedural votes, the kinds that Matt just spoke about. And here the logic should be, well, if you have friends on the other side of the aisle, you should be less likely to serve as an obstructionist and keep their agenda from being able to move forward because a procedural vote does not lock you into any kind of final passage vote. But here too, we found that that was not the case. Women and men within each party were equally likely to obstruct the opposite party's agenda or to push forward their own. And again, social engagement scores played no role. And finally, we looked at the amendment process and who was introducing sort of nefarious amendments. So amendments that weren't like a little tweak, but amendments that were meant to sink a bill. Again, the logic being that you're gonna be less likely to stab your friend in the back if you go out to dinner with them, if you play baseball with them, et cetera. And we found such was not the case. Women and men within their parties behaved exactly the same way and social engagement had no predictive capacity. And finally, when it comes to substantive votes, Women were just as ideologically linked to their own parties and just as driven by party loyalty within the Democratic and the Republican Party as men, and social engagement played no role. So I think it's important here to keep in mind that the norm of uh, collegiality 
is in a lot of ways aspirational. And it does seem to be the case that all else equal, women do place a higher premium on generating the kinds of relationships that make Congress maybe a nice place to work or a little bit less um, heated or emotional. They do seem to value the, the time that they spend outside of the halls of Congress with out partisans and you know, with people who do not share their party affiliation. There are story upon story of female members of Congress talking about you know, going bowling, going to dinner, going to the theater with people who don't share their party affiliation and with whom they find that they have a lot in common. But that commonality is not regarding the legislative process. They might have a lot in common because they both have kids in junior high. They might have a lot in common because they're both living away from their families. They might have a lot in common because of their professional backgrounds, but they're no more likely to agree on any piece of legislation than two similarly situated men who come from two different parties. So it's important, I think, that when we think about how to reform Congress, if we think about ways to make Congress more productive, if we think about ways to make the institution seem more collegial, um, because that might attract a better set of potential candidates, that we not make the assumption that women are going to save the day, because the reality is they're not. And it's very dangerous if we have constituents assume that women are going to be more productive or that women are going to behave any differently than men, because the institutional constraints are basically setting them up to fail. The final piece that I would mention here is that we still only have less than a quarter of our members of Congress as women. And so it might be the case that if you hit 33% or 40% or 45% or some other kind of critical mass, that women might behave somewhat differently and might cohere somewhat differently. But at this point, there's no reason to think that female members of Congress are any less strategic, any less partisan, or any less party loyal than their men. And any conversations about norms or reform, I think, should take into account those empirical realities. I will end by saying that it's still, I think, very important to elect women. I am not suggesting that we should just say, eh, doesn't matter anymore. It's fine if we have 99% men in Congress. We know that women within each party are more likely to prioritize issues that have to do with women, families, and children. We know that women within each party are more likely than their co-partisans to talk about women and to talk about women's issues when they're giving floor speeches. We know that women within each party actually are placing a higher premium on fostering a healthy work environment. Those things are important. It's also important if we want to be any sort of role model to the world that we not rank 100th in terms of women in the national legislature. So it is certainly important both for symbolic and substantive reasons to elect women, but women are not going to be the cure to all that we think ails us when it comes to partisan polarization. Excellent. That's, uh, that's terrific, uh, Jennifer. Thanks for uh, those uh, great analysis and, and for finishing strong on the role of women in Congress. Uh, Maria, do you hear that? Yeah. All right. I got my student here. She's going to run now. Um, uh, we're next going to turn to uh, Don Wolfensberger, who's going to offer his thoughts. Thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Don. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. And uh, first of all, I want to uh, congratulate you on organizing this program and uh, for inviting me, but uh, also on uh, on your having uh, published a, a book now on norms in Congress, a social theory of Congress, which you were kind enough to give me a pre-publication uh, copy of that I could uh, help prepare for the, today's uh, uh, program. Uh, those of us who are Hill veterans have this tendency to uh, wax nostalgic about the past. And uh, we, we tend to embellish or uh, sugarcoat the good things that happened in the days of yore and uh, downplay uh, any of the bad things. And anytime I find myself uh, going uh, a little too far in that direction by uh, touting the uh, golden age of legislating, I am reminded of a quote that I made up several years ago that, that went this way. Uh, the best thing about the good old days are our fond memories of things that never were. And I thought that was a pretty good way of putting it until I ran into a, a quote by George Santiana, the, uh, the Spanish philosopher who uh, in his volume on philosophy Many of us remember his saying that those who uh, do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But in that same volume, he said that history is a pack of lies about events that never happened, told by people who weren't there. And I think what he uh, had in mind, as he mentions a, a few paragraphs later, is that uh, so much of history is incorrectly written that it constantly has to be rewritten. But having uh, laid the groundwork with those caveats and cautionary notes, 
I'm going to forge ahead and say things really were better in the old days. Uh, I started on the Hill in 1969, and uh, in my, my recently published book on uh, changing cultures in Congress from uh, fair play to power plays, uh, I talk about how the culture of Congress has slowly evolved over the last uh, five decades or so from a culture of legislating to a culture of campaigning. Uh, many of you are familiar with the term uh, referring to Congress as, you know, the, uh, as a, a permanent uh, type of uh, politicization that's going on. And I call it more uh, perpetual. It's an ongoing thing where it, it, it's not just a, a campaign from the outside that members are operating, but they're incorporating campaign tactics and language and so on into the operations of the Congress itself. And I think this has been a, a somewhat dangerous development. Um, before I proceed, though, uh, let me just point out that I'm not suggesting that the culture of campaigning has completely replaced the culture of legislating, as Brian points out in, in his book, and as Francis Lee and James Curry do in their recently published book, The Limits of Party. There are still important things that go on across the aisle between the parties in terms of producing you know, important legislation. So I don't want to diminish that, but I will say that the culture of campaigning has come to the fore or the forefront, whereas the culture of legislating has been downplayed or it's below the radar, but members just don't even like to talk about bipartisanship or compromise. But what I have done in looking at these two cultures is to, to come together with four types of norms that I think are associated with each. Uh, first of all, with the culture of legislating, I have four uh, C words as norms, uh, comedy, uh, credibility, civility, and compromise. And you can throw in a couple more C words if you want that are either synonymous or subsumed under one or more of those, cooperation and consensus. But then moving to the culture of, of campaigning, I have uh, norms that are four P words. Uh, partisanship, polarization, pugilism, and paralysis. And I want to just focus briefly on one of those because I think it's uh, pretty important to, to point out, and that is the norm of pugilism or warlike tendencies uh, in the Congress. You know, uh, Clausewitz is credited with having said that, that uh, war is politics by other means. And uh, Foucault said that politics is war by other means. But then former speaker Newt Gingrich, even long before he was speaker, cut to the quick. He said politics is war. And he wrote openly about the fact that he got up every morning and looked in the mirror and girded himself for battle with the enemy, not the other party, uh, not you know, the opposition, but the enemy. The Democrats were the enemy. And that was what characterized, I think, his rise to power within the Republican Party. So what's wrong with uh, this? Uh, sort of this warlike mentality uh, that we find in the culture of campaigning. Well, in campaigning, like in war, it's a zero sum game. One side loses, the other side wins. And there's not much middle ground there for compromise. And I think more and more, you're seeing this, this politics of pugilism uh, playing out in what has been called the war on the floor or the wars on the floor between the parties. Things have become uh, increasingly uh, hyper-tensive. They become uh, increasingly uh, angry sometimes. And so this is what we are witnessing, I think, today to a large extent. So what is to be done? Uh, I think the pat answer is restore the regular order, return to the regular order. And I've been just as, uh, I don't want to say guilty, but I've been I've used that term a number of times because I liked the good old days, all right, when uh, committees met something and bills began at the subcommittee level with, with hearings and then markups, went to the full committee with further hearings and markups, went to the floor with a fulsome debate and plenty of amendments and amendments to amendments and so on, and then eventually moved on to House Senate uh, conference committees where the two bodies would uh, work out their differences. Well, you know, I'm not going to talk a great deal about the floor action or whatever, but I would point out that amendments have been reduced to uh, a very few nowadays. They're limited in terms of debate, maybe 10 minutes 
per amendment, but these are chosen by the majority party uh, in the rules committee for the most part. And Cong former Congressman Woodall will talk probably more about that. But you know, conference committees have gone the way of the dodo too. Nowadays, if they if there's differences to be to be resolved between the two bodies, uh, you oft often have what's called amendment ping pong, where the the differences are are batted back and forth three or four times before they finally come to some kind of agreement. So I think you know that is what uh, we have uh, seen and what has changed. But you know what what can you do to change that culture? And I think the key is uh, members themselves. If they really want to change the culture, they're going to have to demand of their leadership a little more balance of power between the leadership and the committees. And that is where I think things have fallen down, where the leadership but now controls things to such an extent that they're able to dictate uh, what kind of bills are considered when, the priority of legislation, what kind of amendments will be allowed and what amendments will not be allowed uh, on the floor. And, and quite often there's even what I call, or what uh, actually Barbara, uh, can't even, uh, anyway, Sinclair has called uh, committee bypass where there are important bills that are taken up to the rules committee and to the floor without even having gone through committee for a report. So things have changed considerably in that regard. But my point is that if members at least, uh, I think impress upon the leadership that they wanna play a greater role, then I think that the leadership will come to a realization eventually that there's got to be a greater balance of power between leadership control and committee uh, autonomy and activism. Uh, you know, John Boehner, when he became speaker, said, you know, uh, I want members to feel like they're, they're more than just a voting machine. Uh, I want them to, uh, to have more importance and, and powers within their committees and so on. Well, he wasn't able to keep his word that well because they, you know, he tended to rely on the playbook that was handed him by his predecessor, Dennis Hastert, or, or Newt Gingrich before that, and successive uh, Democratic Speaker uh, Pelosi has used the same playbook. But uh, you have to ask yourself, are members really happy with that? And I think, and in, in just looking at the retirement announcements of a lot of members, when asked why they're retiring, well, you know, I just want to enjoy my golden years. Well, no, I mean, they're saying, I was frustrated. I was not I did not feel I was really making a contribution. I was a voting machine and that's about it. And you know, members, when they come to the floor on Mondays, first thing they ask the floor assistants is when is the first vote and when is the last vote? And then they try and space things out in between uh, as far as maybe some committee hearings or uh, office work back in their, their congressional offices and so on. But this has changed things considerably. Let me just wrap up with uh, Woodrow Wilson, who uh, you know, I'm at the Woodrow Wilson Center and. Uh, my first book, I, I wrote some about, about Wilson, but in 1885, he was a graduate student at the Johns Hopkins University, and uh, he wrote a, a rather lengthy treatise that his advisors uh, said that this would uh, really do as your doctoral dissertation, and uh, that's how he got his doctorate, but it became published then as Congressional Government, which is still read widely, and this was published in 1885, but uh, one of the things that he said there that is quite often quoted is that the committees uh, in or our Congress uh, in session is Congress on public exhibition, whilst Congress in its committee rooms is Congress at work. Well, Wilson didn't think much of committees then because they were pretty autonomous and uh, they were not subject to leadership, party leadership control uh, or priorities or whatever. And, but uh, still, I think he made the point that committees really are the workshops of Congress. That, that members uh, do buckle down there, they are workhorses, whereas when they go back to the floor on things, they become the show horses. And I think that's true today. You're not going to change that aspect of it. You're still going to have the pugilism and this, this culture of campaigning. But I think if committees are allowed to be a little more involved uh, in helping to make policy, that you are going to see uh, some kind of a cultural adjustment at least. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to any questions that the audience may have, but I look also look forward to uh, for Congressman Woodall, who was a wonderful rules committee member and I thought had a, a great uh, sense of the institution and uh, I know that I miss him up there and I know his colleagues do too, but thank you. Great. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Don. Um, yes, I uh, will now turn to uh, Mr. Woodall to offer us uh, 
his perspective and thoughts uh, on the role of norms uh, as a sitting member of Congress, uh, and then also maybe some insights as to uh, uh, your your thoughts on the observations of these uh, these great uh, political scientists and scholars. So, Mr. Woodall, I'll turn it over to you. The, I appreciate that, Brian. I'm I'm happy to be here with you. It it uh, uh, is good to be able to speak after uh, folks because. Uh, I'm thinking uh, I only have anecdotal stories. I don't have any data behind uh, my uh, my experiences. I've got 25 years of experiences and all the things that I believe to be true. And whenever the data comes out to disprove what I believe to be true, as Jennifer was saying about some of uh, her premises, uh, perhaps, and what the what the social class would be able to to do to match legislation, I'm thinking, now, how can Jennifer reformulate that study to actually reach the conclusion that she and I both expected to be true uh, when uh, she started down that road? Because we want those good outcomes. And, and I will tell you that I, I don't know that it's true in 2021, because 2021 has been a very challenging year uh, for the United States House of Representatives. But every term I was in Congress, uh, folks back home would ask me, uh, what the most surprising thing is, uh, and I would commit to them that the most surprising thing in Congress is that about six months in, you realize that everybody you'd been watching on TV and thinking they were a scoundrel or a hack uh, or just a pretender uh, trying to get reelected, you suddenly find out is an incredibly sincere, incredibly hardworking, incredibly diligent uh, public servant who just happens to represent a constituency that's entirely different from the one uh, that you represent. Um, that is wonderful news uh, when it comes to, to norms uh, in Congress, because so many of those norms uh, have to be perpetuated each and every Congress. Uh, to Don's point about John Boehner uh, and his love of the institution. I'm uh, excited to see uh, uh, the speaker's book uh, when it comes out uh, next week. I'm going to be interested to see what his uh, take is on, uh, on, uh, on, on where we are today. But my Democratic friends in 2011 would say, Rob, I'm getting more amendments considered under John Boehner's effort to open the Congress back up than I was during Nancy Pelosi's effort uh, to continue uh, a, a democratic control. Now, as Don said, uh, John lost that uh, uh, ability. Uh, that uh, is is eroded uh, both from from outside groups and inside uh, inside pressure. Uh, we now have uh, almost half the Congress that has never seen an open rule in Congress. Uh, how do you perpetuate a norm of partnership? How do you perpetuate a norm of productivity? when you have now uh, all, a plurality of the institution that does not know what it means to be productive in an open uh, congressional culture. Uh, John Dingell told me a story uh, one time about a young member on the Ways and Means uh, Committee uh, who had the audacity to offer an amendment uh, in committee. Uh, and the uh, Ways and Means chairman at that time uh, pulled him aside and said, uh, no, as a freshman member, you're not going to be offering any amendments uh, uh, to uh, this bill on the Ways and Means Committee. And the uh, young freshman said, but I, I came here, I wanna make a difference. I wanna, I wanna be able to affect change. And the chairman said, absolutely, son, you're going to be able to do that. You're just gonna have to wait three or four terms. Now you'll be able to offer that amendment. We're not going to accept it, of course, you'll have to withdraw, but three or four terms from now, you'll absolutely be able to offer it and make that difference that, uh, that you want to make. Uh, I'm not sure when we struggle between the good old days and where we are today that we're necessarily losing anything. Do I miss the open rules that we used to have uh, in the 1990s? Of course I do. Do I miss the appropriations process that I would argue used to bring out the best in partners because we were partnering over a water project that wasn't Republican or Democrat. It was constituently, uh, constituent oriented. We were partnering over issues that transcended uh, partisan divide. I absolutely miss that. But if you go back and look at the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, uh, in, to pick a year in the late 1980s, uh, you'll find 10, 15, 20, maybe on a high year, 30 amendments offered because all the work had been done in committee before it gave it to the House floor. Uh, now I'm gonna have a thousand amendments offered uh, for the National Defense Authorization Act. The Rules Committee is gonna make 300 amendments in order. I had open rules in the 1980s. I have closed rules uh, in, the, in the 2020s, but I'm considering more amendments today under a closed process than I was ever considering under an open process. So the, the norm of being able to participate uh, 
we view as being a floor activity, as, as Don, uh, 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 well, as, as uh, President Wilson accurately uh, described, uh, as, as, uh, as, as theater, I would argue committees have now entered that realm of, of uh, theater. Folks are given a pass to make their political speech during their five minutes. They're not asking a, a question. They're, they're pontificating for four minutes and 58 seconds and trying to get that last question uh, in before the clock expires. It's when the committee uh, adjourns that the work happens. It's before the committee convenes that the work uh, happens. And I, I wonder what that role is for uh, for scholarship, uh, scholars in this country to bridge those policymakers and their constituents. Um, I miss the good old days when parties were running the show. Uh, I blame McCain Feingold for that. It was done with all of the best of intentions, and I think it ended up with a lot of, of very bad results from a from a party control uh, structure. But my class in 2011, many of us were elected uh, over the objections uh, of the party. The, so we got into Congress with absolutely no loyalty uh, to the uh, party apparatus uh, that was uh, that was there. You do need in a majoritarian institution like the House the ability uh, to move legislation, and I applaud the the the, the constant. A drumbeat of change that brings new members to the house. It brought me there, and it took me. Uh, it took me away. But we need those older members who do remember not the good old days, but just a different way of doing the work. And I'll point to my friend Jim McGovern, who now chairs the the Rules Committee. Uh, Jim wants to push an agenda that I find abhorrent uh, for uh, the direction of this uh, of this country but he wants to protect the institution of the house that I love with the same love that I feel uh, for the institution. Uh, he advocates for more voices because he knows he has more votes. Uh, again, you don't get to win in a majoritarian institution, you just get to be heard in a majoritarian institution. And, and that most recent uh, episode with the motion to recommit and the change in the rules package this year indicates what I would would say is my biggest concern about where norms are headed. Uh, I remember it was a Washington and Lee uh, alum uh, who was my LD back in 1994. It was about two months before Newt Gingrich was to be swept into the speaker's chair and Republicans won a motion to recommit on the floor of the house. And my LD was up on top of the desk and he was pumping his fist and it was a big day, big day for, uh, for, uh, for our team. Uh, did it amount to anything at all? Absolutely not. But it was a rare ray of sunshine as a minority member in the United States House that you were able to win a procedural vote. Well, when I got to freshman orientation, they taught me exactly as you said uh, uh, earlier, Brian. These are procedural uh, votes. I don't. Th this is not a policy decision. This is not a. This is not a question of substance of any kind. This is about controlling the floor, and you're either with us or you're against us, but this is not something you defend in a campaign as being policy. This is something you defend in a campaign as, as, as being practical for controlling the majority's institution. We're more successful on the Republican side at keeping our members together. And so the change in the rules package this year that eliminated instructions with the motion to recommit did not advance anybody's policy goal. It masked a cohesion problem that the Democratic Party had in 1994, and they had it uh, in 2010, and they have it again today. And it's a, it's, a, it's a political problem that Republicans have been able to exploit. Do I want to waste the time on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives uh, arguing about uh, 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 political uh, challenges? I don't. I would rather be doing policy. But the more you tighten down the vice of control from the leadership, the more you push control down on the institution, the harder it becomes to manage members. And if you have any doubt about that, think back to 2016 with the sit-in on the floor of the, of the US House of Representatives. As a lover of the institution, I was appalled by the, the way the minority party uh, uh, ignored the rules of the institution they were a member of in order to advance a policy goal that they had but they were doing it in the name of good public policy. It frayed relationships for quite a long time. Folks wanted a pound of flesh for what they considered a, 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 an inexcusable 
um, it, ignoring of a decade upon decade upon decade of, of house uh, tradition. But they were serious members who did it. And because those relationships were already intact, we were able to find our way back from that uh, place. And it did not have a long and lasting uh, impact for either team uh, in, uh, in terms of, of making the house a more difficult place to operate in. That cannot be said of 2021 uh, so far. It has had a debilitating uh, effect on the house. The members I talked to there today uh, who have been there for decades say this is absolutely the lowest point uh, of their time in Congress. Whether they're Republicans or whether they're Democrats, the, the, the bonds that folks used to rely on uh, to get them through the, the darker days uh, are, are less present uh, than they have been. More newer members there who have never had an ability to create those bonds, uh, more retiring members who've taken those bonds out the door uh, with them. Uh, I want to believe that uh, we can craft the, the uh, study so that Jennifer can find that relationships absolutely uh, make, a, uh, make a difference in getting things done. I just believe that it happens at a place as uh, she said, that she doesn't get to see, um, that we need to find a way to shine the spotlight on the, not the dozens of successes, but the hundreds of successes that happen every single day in the halls of Congress between members, between staff, between outside groups and, and inside, uh, inside folks. I worry as more people run against the institution that they want to serve in, instead of in favor of the institution that they want to serve in, that we begin to change our expectations. And if, again, if you have any doubt, watch the campaign commercials uh, from last season. Many fewer campaign commercials about what I got done, many more campaign commercials about what I wanted to do, but only I was thwarted uh, by the other side. I no longer campaign on success, I campaign on hopes of success. Uh, and candidly, I think our country is in a place where we can't depend on hopes for success. So we need some actual measurable uh, success. And we do have serious men and women uh, who want to deliver that uh, for us. So thanks for letting me be here today with you, Brian. Great. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Woodall. Uh, appreciate that. Um, we want to turn now to questions. Uh, we have a hard stop at 1.30, which I want to be respectful of. So let's be mindful of uh, the time you take to ask questions and to uh, time you take to answer them. Um, uh, Maria and I will be scanning the, uh, uh, the, the chat and the video for uh, particular questions. You can type it if you want. Remember to please uh, mute your microphones when you're finished asking. And I would be utterly remiss if I did not call on the first person to be uh, Bill Connolly, my predecessor at Washington and Lee University. Uh, so uh, Professor Connolly, if you want to ask uh, the first question uh, of, of our panel. Uh, don't Thank forget you, to unmute yourself there. I think I have, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Brian. This is an excellent panel. I'm very impressed. Uh, I appreciate all the comments various people have made. The trade-off between conflict and compromise, is this a constant in our politics? And if so, why? Could we have had this conversation any time over the last two plus centuries, including in eras of so-called good feeling like the 1950s, which by the way, included McCarthyism. And if it's worse, as I think Rob was suggesting toward the end, is it a function of, um, is it more conflictual today because of the growth of government? You may remember in the 1990s, James Q. Wilson famously said, at one time, politics was about a few things. Today, politics is about everything. Can I, can I say something? Can I respond? Great. Uh, I mean, I have two thoughts in terms of uh, the longitudinal argument here. The first is that we've created disincentives for cooperation. So I'm not sure that things are any less conflictual than they've been, but there are fewer incentives to resolve those conflicts. Earmarks are a perfect example. When you take earmarks out of the process, you take away the ability for members of Congress who otherwise might not love a bill to still sign on. Um, forget even coming together to figure out a project that they would like to be included. Included. So right off the bat, that's one way that we're disincenting, disincentivizing um, cooperation. The other, 
is that with social media and the ease with which you can attack a potential opponent or a primary opponent online, you don't have to spend the kind of money that you used to spend to run an ad. You don't have to make the kinds of decisions that you would have to make strategically in a campaign. And as a result, you know, you have time and time again, parties at the state level and at the local level punishing members of Congress who may have just done the right thing that was in the you know, good of the American people wasn't exactly what the hyper partisans within their district might have liked. And so those two factors together, I think, suggest that even if the level of conflict is the same that it's always been, the level of incentives for cooperation are far less. Uh, Don, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I think Bill makes an excellent point in, in terms of uh, the government getting uh, much bigger and into more things and uh, the amount of conflict being raised. I was impressed by George Will's column today about how uh, increasingly the government is putting saddles on the back of the states and, and uh, limiting what they can do if they really want government largesse in return. But, you know, I, I do think that that is an excellent point and we have to find some ways, both from the standpoint of our organizational ability as a government, but also our fiscal situation is getting very much out of hand. So, you know, I think that conflict will not necessarily be reduced overnight if we start hold, cutting back on some of this, but it, it, I think that has been a, certainly a, a been a factor. Great. Any of our other panelists uh, uh, care to respond or do we have other, other questions? Uh, I also want to uh, give the, uh, the, the panelists a chance to, uh, uh, to react to one another. So I'm going to look through the chat, but if, if there's some follow-up questions that any of the panelists might like to offer um, uh, based on what we heard during the remarks today, now would be a good time to, uh, uh, to go ahead and offer your, 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 your secondary thoughts. And I think everybody's unmuted who's a panelist. Anybody? Oh, geez. Oh, so nobody heard that. I'm so sorry. You'd think a year into this pandemic, I'd have Zoom figured out. Uh, if the panelists would like to uh, add anything to what each of, of you said, uh, please respond to one another. I'm sure there were things that were, were mentioned as we uh, were going along that perhaps you'd like to react to one another. Um, uh, I certainly have questions for you, but I'd rather give you all a chance to, uh, to talk, uh, talk among uh, yourselves. Um, yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, Julia mentioned in her uh, uh, comments about changes in in uh, in the relationship between Article One and Article Two uh, today. Again, I, my my experience is anec anecdotal. I was in college during uh, Dan Quayle's uh, years. I didn't need social media to keep me abreast of of every gaffe that happened during the day. I got that in a printed uh, form uh, throughout the time. And so I wonder sometimes whether we whether we really have the dial set correctly for what's different today. I'm thinking Lyndon Johnson would have been the closest uh, analogous uh, president uh, to President Trump in that he ruled with a heavy hand. Uh, and uh, it was not that folks did not find disagreements with President Trump as the, as the uh, head of the party. It was that folks found vast disagreements, but the consequences for expressing those disagreements publicly were too painful uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do. What would, would you say that that is a dramatically different uh, dynamic that existed only in the Trump presidency? Or can we go back to, to presidencies of fear uh, that, uh, that you've seen uh, historically? Yeah, I, I like this, presidencies of fear. That would be a great book title. Um, the, so the way I've been thinking about it is less about the president and more about the political incentives of the members of Congress. And it seems to me like even even in the Johnson years, and that's a really good example. I've been thinking a lot about the contrast with FDR and his attempt to consolidate his party around a vision um, and the limitations that he met. And the reason I think that he met those limitations, and I think this was still the case for Johnson, I think it was still the case even maybe 10 or 15 years ago, is that members of Congress had their own kind of distinct political incentives that were kind of decoupled from the national party to a greater degree and Trump's influence over the constituents. I mean, that has sort of been the thing everyone has cited as the main, as the main explanation for why, why Trump was so successful with this presidency of fear. 
Um, but you're right that Johnson was, an, was another example and that's without the sort of social media um, mm -hmm. apparatus. And as I'm, I'm saying this, I, I'm realizing I'm not sure people have really tested like alternative explanations. It would be interesting to think about that. Um, but I also think the kind of critical element of that is that it it is a lot of this a lot of these more contemporary um, phenomena with regard to the the way that nationalized politics work and the way that presidents have influence over members of Congress as a result are sort of broad but an inch deep um, and that's I think also an important contrast with the past. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's a really um, really useful question. Thank you. Let's, um, I, I see uh, we're getting some questions in the chat. So let me, I'm gonna paraphrase uh, one that's come from Lorelai Kelly. Uh, uh, since we're doing this uh, on Zoom during the pandemic, uh, we've seen uh, Congress uh, has adopted new technologies and uh, uh, we've seen some changes to the way meetings uh, can occur electronically and other things. Um, I know I'm paraphrasing uh, Lorelai's question, but what are some of the outcomes of these changes and what, things out of the pandemic uh, do you think we might might hold on to? Uh, have they affected the norms, uh, the way that members interact? Uh, in a way of relating it to this conversation, I mean, has a virtual Congress uh, become normatively more, more acceptable, do you think? I see Don. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent question. One of the, you know, I've been very critical of the fact that the uh, Congress or the House has allowed uh, proxy voting on the floor where members have to give their proxies on specific uh, votes to members that are, are there, absent members can vote that way. I've been critical of that, but I've, I think I've been supportive of the virtual committee uh, hearings and markups because I think that allows for a lot more uh, flexibility and uh, that uh, you will probably have a, a greater variety in terms of the witnesses that you can get and so on. So. I would think that that might be something that Congress would want to continue uh, in a controlled manner, at least when the uh, pandemic uh, shutdown is over. But uh, I, I'm, I think that really will help committees. Terrific. Anyone else uh, want to weigh in on that? Well, I remember when the Rules Committee changed the rules, Brian, to allow us to carry cell phones on the floor. Uh, for the very first time. You couldn't talk on it, but you could use that BlackBerry because that BlackBerry was now critically important to, to getting your work uh, uh, done. Um, well, now we have our tablets uh, on the floor and occasionally you're going to find a, a, a renegade laptop that's made it uh, uh, to the floor. Uh, very valuable for getting information, um, very detrimental to what used to be a conversation that I was going to have with my colleague who was sitting uh, beside me. I think there's an enormous amount of productivity that's come out of the virtual committee process uh, and you get to go into each other's homes uh, from 2,000 miles away and it develops an intimacy that was actually surprising uh, to most members uh, of, of Congress. But what you miss is the conversation you had walking into the committee room and the conversation you had walking out of the committee room and our two staffers were there with us in the committee room and all of that productivity has now gone away. And I hope that the norms of counting on that uh, 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 idle time in the hallways as being productive time uh, does not go away as well. Terrific. Someone else? Anyone else? Um, I see, uh, uh, I don't want to look like I'm playing uh, favorites here, but I see Luke Basham, uh, who did some of the uh, very helpful uh, and excellent work uh, in, in my own book, uh, on the Senate maiden speeches, and he's now a PhD student at, at George Washington University. Uh, Luke has his hand raised, and we're going to uh, turn it over to him. Hi, Luke. Hey, Professor Alexander. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm a first year poli sci PhD student at GW. Um, it's good to see a lot of names that I recognize from bibliographies and syllabi. Uh, but, um, and uh, of course, it's good to see Professor Connolly, who inspired me to do a lot of this stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of my research uh, touched on apprenticeship, so new member behavior. Uh, of course, uh, at least mostly with respect to scholarship, this is a more Senate-specific thing, and most of you have touched on the House, but just speaking broadly, are there still discernible norms of new member behavior we see? And um, 
uh, some of you bring up, of course, I don't even need to uh, to mention Green and Bobert. They were name dropped within the first 10 minutes or so. But when we see a lot of these new members drawing the spotlight, it, it can perhaps uh, run contrary to the idea that there are. Uh, so in, in, in any of your experience, I know uh, Dr. Wolfensberger or, or, or Don, you allude to um, the power that leadership plays today and uh, sort of the outsized role there. I wonder also separately, what role does leadership perhaps play in impressing norms on new members, normative behaviors, and these things that we see later on for the duration of careers? Don, go ahead, please. Yeah, since my name was mentioned, uh, one of the things that uh, the Select Committee on Modernization of Congress has dealt with is the extent to which members are separated I don't want to say at birth, but when they first get to the Hill, the freshman members and herded off to the respective party caucuses for their own uh, types of training. And uh, I don't want to say indoctrination, but you get the idea. Whereas the select committee thought that it would be very valuable for to have more bipartisan uh, get togethers for the freshmen initially so that they could learn together about the history and norms of Congress. And I think, you know, that would be, again, striking a, a good balance between obviously the needs of the parties in wanting to impress upon members the need for loyalty, but at the same time, giving members a chance to get to know each other across the aisle and learn a little bit about the institution. Yeah. As an aside, uh, Luke, uh, for our, my freshman orientation, they do, they put you on a, oh, there's a Republican bus and a Democratic bus, and they do separate you right away. Uh, there's also a bipartisan members retreat that is hosted by uh, Harvard uh, during those early weeks uh, with about 103 people in my freshman class. Uh, we all made it uh, to the freshman orientation on Capitol Hill that was partisan. Uh, fewer than 20 of us made it to the bipartisan uh, uh, policy uh, institute uh, at, uh, at Harvard. And that is, you know, that, that rings true still today. All right, I, I see we have, uh, we're getting probably more questions in the, uh, in the chat than we're going to have time to, uh, to get to. Um, let, me, let me try to pull things together and take host's prerogative for, for a last question for our, everyone on the panel. Um, how do new norms sort of get, gain traction? How do they get currency? I think each person spoke to somehow things, norms change. What causes them to change and, and, and what beyond, um, uh, let's say ideological or, or electoral strategic factors allow a new norm to take hold. It strikes me, Julian, looking back at, at your comments on, on uh, um, uh, Donald Trump or, or Matt, perhaps looking at, at your forthcoming work on Newt Gingrich, these folks were entrepreneurs. They were, they were innovative. The way they did things somehow changed the character of what people thought was appropriate in their interaction. Can you say more about that dynamic, which is, you know, in, in two minutes? <laughs> uh, Julia. Sure. Yeah, I, I'll be really brief. I think I think part of this has to do with the contemporary culture of, of trust and the kind of rhetoric around lack of trust in, in structures and institutions. I make the, I think that makes it easier to change norms in this particular this particular kind of way that they change in this particular context. And maybe Matt can speak more broadly to the, not to give you homework, Matt, but, but there you go. <laughs> the spotlight on me in 30 seconds. Uh, well, you mentioned Newt Gingrich. Uh, if we look at the ways in which he changed the norms of his party, if not Congress, uh, persuasion and recruitment, uh, coupled with um, uh, the kind of electoral pressures that members were facing outside the chamber. Um, so he was recruiting members to run for Congress. He gets them in Congress. He has them it encourages them to join the Conservative Opportunity Society, uh, where they're working within this group, a uh, smaller group to talk about the ways that the norm sh norms should change. Um, it's a long-term process for him. Um, but if we were going to talk about norms that maybe discourage partisanship or move things in another direction, I think it's much harder because now the larger political context we're in is all reinforcing the kind of partisan behavior that we see in Congress, right? There was a story about Congresswoman uh, Green who apparently has raised, I don't know, $3 million or something. And she's not on any committee. She's not legislating. Um, but she is using her bully pulpit uh, to fire up the base. Those kinds of things encourage uh, or reinforce existing norms of partisanship. 
Terrific. Well, uh, I think it's better to leave uh, with uh, more questions on the table and, and more discussion uh, to be had. Uh, but we are at our 1.30 mark, uh, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time um, uh, for, for being here. Um, let me say uh, thank you again to our audience members. Uh, we're very grateful for your attendance and participation. Again, given what we're hearing today uh, I, about the role that norms play in Congress, I, I think and I hope that this is the beginning of a much longer uh, and, and fruitful conversation about this important topic. Uh, the panelists and I look forward to continuing to have this conversation among ourselves and, and together with the people uh, who have joined us today. Please reach out to any of us at any time. I'll post uh, and send out a link to our information uh, as well as a link to the video when that's ready. So finally, on behalf of myself, let me extend another generous thank you to our panelists, each of you, I sincerely appreciate it, and to our, uh, uh, our audience for your thoughtful and engaging discussion. Uh, this has been really terrific and, and again, I'm very grateful. So with that, we will come to a close and I'd like to thank you all again and uh, wish you a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.